meeting of the Housing Subcommittee. Uh, may I remind members that this meeting will be recorded and made available for public. Okay, Sergeant, and apologies, please. Thank you, Chairman. There are currently nine members present. No apologies. Joseph Lutherbell, Ask, is there any declarations of interest? It's Jim. Yeah, it's item number seven. Due to be being specifically mentioned actually in the attachment to the report and having received second hand lobbying from the former vice chair of the organisation, I will not take part in this and leave the chamber. Thank you. Other members? Okay. Move on to item four of the report. Uh, Queen Street and neighbourhood. Oh, sorry. Of course I can. Uh, item three, sorry. Uh, we have a presentation by Sustrans on the street design project, and uh, I believe this will be, deliver, be delivered by Paul Ruffle. Paul? Um, my name is Paul Ruffles. I work for Sustrans Scotland. Uh, we've been working in partnership with Dunstan and Galloway Council for a number of years. Um, more recently, on the street design project, which I'm hoping many of you are familiar with. Uh, that's a cross department project for us, which is really good and quite unique for us as well as an organisation, in that it captures both housing and transportation. So, for us, this is very much an exemplar project, not just for the cross department work in, in a partnership with council, but also working with the community in such detail. This really stands out for us as one of the big projects, one we should be shouting about. The uh, project started in May 2013. We actually had a meeting prior to that. And it's due to complete in May 2016. Uh, we do have some objectives. We're not just down here to uh, dig up the street, get everyone cycling. We do more than that. We recognize that good quality places are good for active travel, walking, cycling. Um, this is one of our primary aims of this project. We also are very interested in community-led design in that the community stand up, take a stand, and, and take the project forward from the ground up. And this project very much is a good example of that. We also are interested in how the neighborhood feels. Perception of how spaces feel are very important in what people choose to do and how they choose to travel and make to spend time in places. So leaving this neighborhood a better, safer, and more pleasant and social place is important. Uh, social connections as well, there's, there's a very good correlation between traffic speeds, traffic volumes, and what people choose to do on the street and how much social connection they have with their neighbours and friends. And, and one of our aims is, is to leave behind a more cohesive, stronger neighbourhood. And I think we can, we can achieve that through design and through work with community. And we're not interested in landing the council with things that are liabilities in the future. We're very much interested in long-term, sustainable, simple solutions. That's why I've mentioned work with existing infrastructure. Let's move on. The original Queen Street project, or well, the original project focused on Queen Street, which is the very long line right through the center of the picture. I've marked the fear to rule just to sort of locate where you are. That ties in well with Jim's, sorry, Jim O'Neill's uh, housing renewal area action plan. Is that correct, Jim? We, we took a good look at the project when we first became involved and, and thought it'd be better to expand our interest beyond Queen Street and to incorporate McLennan Street, Brook Street, and Cumberland Street. Um, I'll show you why. If you take an aerial view of Queen Street and the neighborhood, it's very much an island. It's basically severed from the town by Brook Street and Shakespeare Street, two very busy carriageways. And I imagine they were built when traffic volumes were much higher than the left they now. So these red elements represent blocks to cross town movement, and we're very much interested in and also what impact they have on the social connections of the people that live in that neighborhood to the rest of the town. But also how they affect cross-town movement by foot and by cycling. We also recognize there's a very strong link through the street on the north-south axis, represented by those yellow circles. And that's the gateway at the bottom to Brooms Road Car Park. And at the top, that's the access to BG1. And that's quite an important link through to town for um, people walking. And we, we've monitored all this, and we know this is there. Proof as well. Uh, so that's the, the kind of project area. It basically incorporates Queen Street, Brook Street, and Clem Street. Um, key to our interest in this project is working with communities 
we recognize that you can walk into community, do grand things for the street, and walk away and it will fall to pieces or with very little ownership. But we, we are pursuing two strategies with this project with the council. One is a genuine community-led design process working from the ground up. And also a strategy that brings people together and strengthens the connections um, and relationships between people. So when we walk away at the end of the project, there's a legacy. There's a legacy of people that look after the street, look after each other, care about the street. And also there's something in there that people wanted and are happy with and can look after. We did some initial, let's go back one. The initial work with some people on the street was qualitative survey. And these are kind of common themes that come up for many streets across Britain, actually. High vehicle speeds and high traffic volumes. Even though the traffic speeds might be within the limits, they still have a negative impact on people walk through the street. The road crossings, as I mentioned, of Brook Street and Tumble and Shakespeare Street in particular, are quite intimidating, particularly if you're less able or you're in a buggy or wheelchair or there's a real reflection of antisocial behavior there as well. We, not being locals, we don't really see that, but we know that there is an undercurrent that has been in the past. People were very keen on the Victorian character of the street as well. Uh, they love it. It's a real asset to the town. I think that's something we can make more of. I think that's being done anyway through Jim's uh, strategy with the HRA. And people really do want to get to know their neighbors on the street. They really are keen to kind of have a bit more of a social life bit more of a connection. That's coming through the project. So we've done 16 events in the neighborhood since May 2013. Huge amount of investment from all of it. Uh, on average, we've had about 11% turnout of the whole residential population, and about 24 people at each event on average. Um, and as I mentioned, there's two strategies. One is community-led design, and the other one is strengthening the community. So just focus on the community-led design briefly. Um, the concept designs for the street have been developed with the community over nine sessions. Uh, that's involved us, it's involved council staff as well directly, and it's involved the community. It's very much three parts of the project. And some of you may recall, we actually road tested the ideas on the street last August with carpet, cones, and paint. And that's us on the street, the residents, trying them out in a discussion. A bit more detail on the physical work. So I'm aware I'm really chatting, so I'll, I'll slow down a bit here. Um, the, this is a planned view of the area, and the red circles represent where we're putting something called gateway features. Now, gateway features for us are areas that say something positive about the neighborhood, reflect the quality and respect the character of the street, and also do something functional. They're going to manage traffic movement through that space. So these red circles, they'll be raised tables. They'll span the full length of the junction. They will be made up of inlaid stone and tarmac. They will enable pedestrians to walk across the junctions without having to drop off a curb. So if you're less able, it'll be easier to negotiate. They'll reduce the crossing distance, so it'll be a lot quicker to get across those junctions, safer. Um, and it also means as a pedestrian, you haven't got to dog leg to different crossings or block curbs and stuff. So the priority is very much firmly on pedestrian movement across the front of the street and through the street. The, uh, the other function they'll do is they'll slow traffic down as it comes into the street, the junction radii and tighten. And what we're trying to also do is discourage through traffic. We want people to come into this area in their cars if they've got a reason to be there or a reason to travel through. We don't really want people uh, rat running, which they currently do from Grooms Road to Shakespeare. Rat running is the wrong word, but they, they do use it. The area in blue will simply be um, a redump reduction of the um, junction radii to make it easier to cross. It's a very wide junction at present, opposite Audi. So a bit more detail about the uh, a visual on the gateway features. This is the Theatre Royal, one of your great assets in the street. It's also within the conservation zone. Uh, it's just a sketch up at the moment or a view of it. Uh, and what you can probably guess from there is you can see the raised table to the right in white and black. But actually, the space outside the theatre, if you look at that at the moment, it's basically constrained. If you come out of the theatre, you come onto a very small pavement, and there's not much space to go. It doesn't really do the theatre much justice. So the proposals that we're putting forward would, would enhance the pavement, bring it right out into the carriageway, and create more of a spill-out social space. In the street. It would also reduce the carriageway, make it easier to cross the roadway. 
and make it easier for pedestrians and cyclists to go up and down those two streets. And what we're trying to do with this is, is try to reconnect the two halves of Queen Street. You see, um, Shakespeare Street does a very good job of dissecting at the moment. Uh, just focusing on the center of the street, this is McLennan Street with the yellow circles at the moment. Once again, these would be raised tables, so we'd have low planters, and we hope this planter will be built by community payback, so it's another local client. They'd have the same kind of quality feel as the rest of the interventions as well. So once again, we're trying to respect the Victorian character of the neighborhood. And as a pedestrian, you'd have no curves to negotiate. You'd be able to go from junction to junction now, any way you want, actually, as well. And you'd be far more visible to traffic. And what we're trying to do is give greater priority and emphasis. And this is a people's space. This is a space where people have more priority, more, more control of this. The area in green to the right is the community garden at the moment. It's actually got an edible garden in there, manufactured by community payback, planted up by incredible edible. And that's a space gifted to the project by Scottish Power. So there's already a local buy-in from, from organizations. And what would happen with all these features is what we're trying to do is slow traffic down, reduce traffic volume, bring speeds down along with the 20 mile an hour designation so that character and the feel of the neighborhood changes. We have a positive space, a place that says something good about the neighborhood and where traffic and pedestrians are balanced rather than the other way around. Vehicles have higher priority. That's a view of McLennan Street looking down towards the daycare center or the day center. It's quite hard to visualize. There's a sketch on the bottom showing a, a different angle on it. And you can see the inlaid stone. That would be made up of a, a reconstituted stone. So it's not granite, but it's a high quality stone. Uh, planters on the street as well, hopefully manufactured by community and, and the raised tables in the center. Uh, the greenery does a great thing as well. It will soften the street. It's quite a hard street at the moment. Cool. So a lot of text on there about what we think will happen. And we, we're quite confident about these, actually, because we this is project number five of seven for us. And on the previous five projects, we, we've had very positive outcomes. More people do walk and cycle if we slow down traffic speeds and reduce traffic volume. And we know that from projects in Path Headington Tully just completed, where we had a 65% increase in children uh, and adults walking and a 7.5% increase in children cycling. Rates. It does happen. Very small intervention. And in Sinclair Town and Katrine Crescent, which is probably we've had a 38% reduction in traffic volume and a 15% reduction in traffic speed. So it, it does have a positive impact. And looking more at the quality of thing, and, and this is the bit I'd like to stress, is that the costs now for this are kind of offset in terms of the future costs because what you're doing is you're investing in the social, physical, and mental well-being of the street and the neighborhood. Because um, more people will have a, a better more friends, basically, we know that happens with the project in the street. The social connections will be stronger. More people will take an active interest in the street and each other. And uh, your, your future physical costs for health and mental well-being will, will be offset as well. So it's a positive statement for us, a positive outcome. So this is a uh, picture of the new streetlights in situ, and they were chosen by a resident. Design. They're specifically designed, we've been told, so that seagulls can't perch on them. So we'll see if that happens or not. I don't know if that's true, but um, it's a good story. Um, we already know there's stronger social connections, and we can testify to that. Friendships are really growing now. People know each other. And there's a real burgeoning element of work going on without us being aware. And we're seeing that now in the DG1 Neighbours Facebook page, which is, I think, the first step towards the Tenants and Residents Association going that way at the moment. And there's local initiative, initiatives picking up art groups and gardening events that are happening already. So the street lighting's already gone in. That was funded by Jim with a small contribution from, from us. Sorry, sorry, Jim, your department. I apologize. <laughs> uh, new litter bins have gone in, and they were requested by a resident. We've put a community notice board up this week, and I recommend if you're down there to have a look at it. That was designed by a local blacksmith as well. We've got the edible garden space at the bottom of the street built by community payback and adopted by residents. And we had a really successful front garden competition. You can still see the remains of that on the street, which we're hoping to resurrect this year with all the plant pots. 
people take an active interest in their front garden. In terms of the bigger work at the moment, the resurfacing is already taking place. So all the streets except Cumberland Street are going to be resurfaced. That's on the one of the wish lists for residents. Residents are working with artists on a gateway design for Brooms Road and DG1, and they're quite spectacular. They make a positive statement for the area. The street signs are all due to be replaced in the next couple of weeks, and that's with a cast iron, more fitting street signs rather than the less quality ones at the moment. And we're already starting to get people out and about on bikes and leg walks and yes, cycle rides. Things are really happening. So what our hope is that when the project ends in May 2016, the cost and the impetus behind this project will just carry on. The cost will be negligible because we'll have a group of committed, uh, empowered residents who take an active interest in each other and the street. So a final slide, this is one of our lead rides using a local fire bike scheme and we're looking for membership for lots of residents for this at the moment. So in summary, we think this is an exemplar project. We're really glad to be working with Dunfermline and Galloway Council. We're really glad to be working across departments. It's very good for us. That shows a kind of an understanding of the whole environment, not just the roads or the housing, but looking at the whole environment. The community engagement on this is exemplar, it really is for us. It is, it's something we want to shout about. And this genuinely is a community-led design. The designs have come from the bottom up, blank pages to where they are now, from residents. And uh, empowerment, it really is there. We've seen that on every project we work with. We do walk away from projects where people have much more active interest in each other and will take care of themselves and their neighbours. Uh, that's that for me. I'm more than happy to take any questions. I don't know how the format works. Thank you, Paul. Um, <coughs> it's interesting. I think it is, it's just as important that um, residents within uh, within a, a town or, or a city, even in bigger cities around the country, get that feeling of belonging to a community. Uh, and I mean, we associate that with uh, with all the, the villages and the, and the rural areas. But I think it's just as important that that members in the, of a community within a township gain that feeling too. And by what you were showing us here, it seems that. And I was impressed with the, the community engagement had on that, and we'll come to that in the, the next report as well with the list of what's been going on. So, so that was really impressive. Everyone. Members, do you have any questions for Paul? Bearing in mind we're, we're discussing this particular project in the next item in the agenda. Any general questions? No? Okay, thank you, Paul. Moving on then, item four. Queen Street and Neighbourhood Street Design Project. Uh, this report is to update members on the progress made in taking forward the Queen Street and Neighbourhood Design Street Project uh, and to seek agreement to undertake the statutory advertising of traffic orders that are required to deliver the proposed works. In addition, the report seeks members' agreement to allocate 165000 from council tax on second homes income to allow the project to be delivered in full. Um, can I ask Jim, have you anything else to add to this report? Thanks, Chair, and I think Paul covered most of it in his presentation, but we're happy to answer any questions that might have. Thank you. I'll open it up to members. Colin? Th thanks very much, Chair. I mean, I have to say I'm, I'm hugely supportive of, of this particular project. I mean, I, I don't think I can stress enough that when I actually first got elected, 2007, wasn't it? Um, the only contact I was really getting from the Queen Street area was complaints about antisocial behaviour. Uh, and I have to say there was, there was a lot of complaints. That, I have to say, has largely disappeared. And, and I think um, we, we're actually seeing in that, that particular community a real sense of community being developed. And I think that's in no small part to the work that's been done by, by Paul and his team and also working um, with various council departments uh, and really generating and, and supporting that sense of community. The community have been hugely involved in the project right from the very start. It's very much been a bottom-up project. People have been given the opportunity to put their views forward. And I think what we're seeing um, presented by Paul in, in terms of the project is something that's actually come very much from the community. We've seen the improvements already in terms of the street lights, the, the new railings that a lot of people have, have been able to, to, to put into their, their front gardens as a result of the funding the committee previously, um, previously allocated. And I think if this project, and we do support this project today, um, it will make the area an awful lot more attractive for residents uh, and, and crucially a, a lot more accessible for pedestrians. Now the reality is if we do support the project today, we're going to get complaints. We're going to get complaints from people who drive along the street 
to use it as a shortcut in the way to the crate in because they might not be able to drive as quickly as they did previously. And I have to say I'm quite relaxed about those particular complaints. I think that we very often forget that the town centre is not just about people coming into shop and people driving in the town centre. There's an awful lot of people who actually live in Dumfries town centre and I think they deserve as, as good an environment as anybody wherever you live in Dumfries and Galloway. And I think this project is very much about delivering uh, that, that, that stronger environment. We want to encourage people to, to, to live in the town centre and I think this will play an important part uh, to achieve that. And I think it's also in the context of other improvements that are taking place in and around the area. We're about to see work beginning in uh, three new townhouses uh, in the Gap site just next to the Scottish Power um, uh, buildings at the moment. I think that'll make a big improvement and I think we're really seeing a, a, a real upturn in that particular area. So I'm hugely supportive of the project. Uh, it ties in um, nicely with the work that's taking place at the Theatre Royal um, in terms of the improvements there and it's really going to re help regenerate a, an important part of Dumfries Town Centre. I'm pleased to see that the report today is asking for the whole project to go ahead uh, and okay that's going to uh, require additional support from, from the committee here today but I think it's important to deliver that full project. We've come quite a long way so far uh, and I think we need to see this uh, right through to the end and, and really help regenerate that area so I'm very happy to support the, the recommendations in the report. Any other members? Jane? Um, yes, the whole principle behind the, uh, the proposal is absolutely right. Um, I entirely endorse, uh, I don't know if Councillor Smith is a local member, I take it that he is, and uh, I agree with him um, that we should be quite willing to take on the chin any complaints uh, that might come uh, in terms of um, driving through. I have no problem with that at all. Um, there are two things. One thing, uh, it's just a comment, which is that isn't it interesting how the Victorian character is so hugely important to the locals? And this council uh, basically took away the Victorian character of the opening um, building to Queen Street um, in the form of Western Kane. Removed, gone, such a mistake, fundamental mistake. And I hope very much that members will look at what people find important, Victorian character, the character of the area, and take that on board uh, when they are thinking about demolishing houses um, in the rest of Dumfries. I hope very much people will take that on board, because in fact, actually, um, that was clawed away, and I think a fundamental error was made. Um, and um, in Queen Street um, dissent, I would have, I would have said that that was a real mistake, and we should learn from that. Um, the second part of this is a question with respect to the policy on second tax, uh, council tax, second homes, uh, use of that budget. Um, could I please be reminded about what is our policy with respect to use of that, um, that budget um, and how it actually sits with what has been proposed here? Thank you, Jane. I mean, just uh, on, on your first point there with reference to property that was demolished uh, and I mean I think it's come from the community consultation and as you rightly say the, the Victorian side of it um, people seem to to want to keep uh, and they enjoy that um, and that's how they through the community they, they came up with the light design and that's what they prefer to go in as, as, as you showed us on the picture uh, but the property also has to be kept within reasonable state I mean I don't think anybody who's in support of uh, Victorian properties in an area that they live um, would would want any of those properties to be in such a derelict state and such a mess that it, it um, degrades from the area rather than complements it. Um, but, and I'll ask John to stance on the second point. Yeah, thanks. Uh, um, in terms of uh, the application of the income derived from the second home uh, um, uh, income from uh, council tax, uh, the uh, statutory instrument uh, allows local authorities to apply that funding um, to anything that it defines as um, housing related projects. Um, and obviously, in this case, what we've got is an overriding housing regeneration area plan that was agreed by the subcommittee. Um, and linked to that is the associated uh, community and public realm work. Um, and as, as a whole, um, it, it certainly meets the definition of a housing related project because key to this is improving the residential area for the, for the people within Queen Street and associated areas. Um, so that, that's the position. Jim. Thanks, Chair. Just to, to rattle my colleague Maitland's uh, 
heet, maar als we Victorian building things, I'd love to take it down and personally take it down <laughs> brick by brick, because it's a blight on, on, on the community and has been for years and years and years. So there's sometimes real merit in taking away properties irrespective of what the designation is. But what I would like to say is, I think there's a, there's a very, very good message here going to the communities and the staff. The lighting thing is special, I think. Traps is nice and something else to do. And in most communities, we just turn up, stick lampposts in, don't even talk to the community in advance of doing that. No consideration about what fits best in a community. It's just done. And I think we should be considering how to roll this type of programme out to our communities to ensure, even if it's standard everyday lighting, that they're actually with us and they know about it. And it's not just lighting, it's the whole development of communities at large, because currently, we turn up, do work, and we don't do the consultation and engagement we should be getting. But anyway, that aside, that's maybe my rant for this morning. Uh, this is a great project. It looks very, very good, and I'm sure uh, the community is pleased, and especially people in the area are pleased it very much. I'm just a uh, uh, point in saying that with the community, and with the, in the Appendix 5, there's a list of the various uh, engagement and that, that's been held with the community. And it is interesting to see and how the community have participated in this. You know, there's a, a, a new light celebration. They've had a big lunch, get your hands dirty, planting days, a stained glass workshop, all these type of events that have been put on. And the community uh, have been engaged with this. And uh, I just think that type of event, and, and by the participation of the residents you've had in the area, it, it just shows there is that growing sense of the community there. And I think that's, that's always got to be for the good of, of any particular area. Um, and just one one question I'd maybe like to ask, the, the extra costs that, that we have involved, that's all come because of aspirations that the community would like to see done within that within that whole project area. Yeah, thanks, Chair. The initial budget, as I said, it was a kind of notional budget, but it wasn't based on any plans because it's been through the whole community participation in the design process. The plans have evolved over time. And I think that the... The, the increased funding that's required is indicative of, of the success of the project because residents have been very well engaged. They've become very aspirational about their neighbourhood and they very much want to see significant change rather than tinkering. So it's very much the, the local residents that have driven what they would like to see done and associated with that has been an increase in the, the project cost. But it's been through a positive community engagement process. And, and the extra has been supported by some friends yeah. as well, so I mean, yeah. that's a piece of it. Any members? Yep. Finley. Thanks, Chair. Um, I'm a bit concerned there's a there's a quite a substantial amount of money that's going to road improvements. Uh, I'm not sure, actually, in the, the spirit of the what we've got with this, the second uh, uh, Homes Council tax, actually we should be spending that money on, on road improvements. Can you just confirm that... Uh, on page uh, five, it suggests that there's an acceleration of the planned maintenance work. I, I presume that's not been paid out of this budget. So okay. the uh, and, and back on page nine, the, the bulk of the uh, the work. How much of that's actually involved in, in the road, the traffic calming, and the the road improvements and whatever? Because it, it would concern me that uh, this money is coming out. The second homes council tax is going to, to, to uh, for road measures. Uh, thanks, Chair. The resurfacing is planned work that the Council already is going to undertake, and all we've done is agreed with colleagues in E&I and DG First that that work's brought forward because we didn't want to have a situation where the Council was perceived to be spending money on additional things while the road was in a fair state of repair. So that's planned Council work that's been brought forward. In terms of the street design work, I think Paul, uh, maybe want to help answer that as well. This is not a road project. That is not what it is. It's a neighbourhood design project. And the, the measures that have been proposed are not primarily driven by traffic management. They've been developed by the local community and it's much more about creating shared communal community space and prioritising local residents and people that pass through the neighbourhood either on foot or on bike. So in terms of what it's trying to achieve, one of the things that if we want to regenerate any area or any part of a town, 
it must be done in a holistic way. So in the past, the, the, the kind of regeneration projects that have failed have tried to tackle one issue. So they've either tried to tackle a housing issue, design issues, layout issues, but done them in isolation. And key to that, the, the failed projects haven't involved people in the design and delivery. But certainly Sustrans would argue very strongly, and I may be speaking for Paul here, that Sustrans do not do road projects. They do street design community-led projects. But Paul, do you want, maybe want to say something? Uh, I think Jim's done a very good job actually of summarising what I would have said. But um, Jim, Jim's right. We, we, we are definitely not just interested in roads. We recognise that good quality places and places in terms of spaces where you have layers of different things happening, so social connections, emotional connections, historical connections, not just actually a physical place. Place is very good for active travel, walking, cycling. But it's also good for peace and social. For us, this really isn't investment in the road. It's investment in, in the neighbourhood. Um, and I appreciate if you look at it from a road's perspective, from your point, where it's just a few speed bumps. But it isn't. The, the process of how we got to this stage is quite quite unique. It's very rare that councils have the liberty or staff or time to take that bottom-up approach and take it to this point. And it really is driven purely by, by what the issues and opportunities that residents have raised. So we're not going in there just to tackle traffic speed, traffic volumes. What will make this place a better place to spend time in? What will make it a better place to let your kids play in? What will make it a better place to meet your friends or to walk or to travel? So from a, an abstract perspective, it looks like a few speed bumps, but very much it is a system. Yeah, I, quite well yeah I, 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 I feel a bit patronised there. I realise it's not just about speed Sorry, bumps. Sorry, I, no, uh, I didn't mean to patronise. Uh, I, I think my point is we're looking at Six hundred and fifty thousand pounds, and most of that work actually is work on roads. So I wonder whether it's the right budget we're coming out. I know we're all trying to achieve the, the same thing: slowing traffic down, make a nice area. I appreciate that's not lost to me, uh, but it's whether the, the money we're taking out of the second homes should actually be paying for that and not another budget. You talk about departments working together, and that's important. But should this money really be coming out of the second home council tax? That's what, that was my point. Yeah, yeah sorry, I didn't mean to patronise that. Yeah, I understand that, Finley, but I think um, <clears throat> I think part of the, the proposed success of, of the project, uh, and it seems to be so far through the community side of it, is probably, and, it, and it's stated in the report, it's the first time that a project like this has been carried out in Dumfries and Galloway, where all the elements are coming together at the same time. Uh, and I think it's important, rather than if, if we approach this in a, in a piecemeal um, type of project, where one piece being done and then baking months later, some more funding for another part of the project, it just wouldn't have the same effect at all. And I, and I think it's important for, the, for the, the residents of that area to try and take that forward. And the money for the, the roads work um, will come out of the, the roads department budget for, for the resurfacing. So. Alistair? Well, let me say for the record, Chair, I'm totally supportive of the, the terms of the report. I particularly commend uh, Colin Smith for the, you know, for, for the way in which he uh, you know, sort of uh, his excellent summation of, of the background to it. Uh, I have a question, Chair, uh, and it relates, in fact, to the use of the uh, the, the uh, council tax uh, income, uh, purely uh, to say uh, how much uh, is left, in fact, uh, in that fund. Uh, that's the question, Chair, but, you know, I would couch it with comments. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, on the back of uh, Mr. Lynch's response, it's perfectly competent for us as an authority, to use this money uh, in, the, uh, in the fashion which we're proposing to, on the basis that it's a housing-related project, and I stress a housing-related project. That is the driver, and I have no problems whatsoever with doing that. Indeed, I am fully supportive of it, Chair. I think it would be a very great, great, very grave mistake, Chair, if we got ourselves into the, sort of, the lagger mentality that, you know, this fund can only be used in that particular part of the Fleece and Galloway in particular area. At the end of the day, if we have the, if we have the legitimate right if we have the legitimate right to use funding, as it were, for such projects, irrespective of whether it's you know, in the more peripheral or in the you know, areas or, or in the urban areas, we do that and we make a proper job of it. Uh, so, as I say, that's my views on it, sir. Uh, but I would be grateful to know, purely for interest, Chair, no for any other reason other than for interest, 
how much you know with uh, the the £165,000 uh, used, as I hope it will be, how much will be left in, in the fund at this moment in time? John, can you please repeat your that? Yes, thanks, Chair. Um, at uh, the last strategic housing investment plan we reported before Christmas, we reported on the balances on council tax second home. That's subject to sort of £2 million. Um, so if we take $165,000 off, it's like approximately $1.9 million, so that's about in balance uh, if the number Grateful for the information, Jim. Thank you. Jeff? Yeah, I'm fully supportive of this project. You know, when I first moved to Dumfries on Queen Street, it was a, quite a dark area. She wasn't particularly attractive for, for people going down there. The reference was made to the, uh, the Theatre Royal. Now, this will improve the environment around the Theatre Royal. How does the completion, how does the date for the completion of this project tie into the, um, the reopening of the uh, Theatre Royal? Because obviously, it'd be quite nice to see reasonably well to implement. Thanks, Chair. They're broadly running in parallel, but in terms of the stakeholder engagement uh, representatives of the, the Theatre Royal Trust have been attending the meetings and we've had discussions with their architects. What we'll do is ensure as the delivery process happens that we're, we're doing things at the right time and they coincide. So we have those relationships in place already and they have been involved in the, the design work. We'll make the, the delivery fair at this point. Graham. Thank you, Chair. It's nice to see our town councillors try to emulate their poor country relations. Uh, they're trying to create a village atmosphere in the middle of the priests and get the community together. Those of us who serve the more repart, the more uh, rural areas have that already. I'm not averse to spending the money or giving the 165. If we're going to do it, let's make a good job of it. But I would merely point out one thing. Most of the income the second house council tax comes from rural areas and villages. I'm thinking of Port Patrick, Hampshire, where probably half the house is the second home. So, you know, by all means, give it to them, priests. I hope you create a village atmosphere in the middle of the town and you build good communities. But don't forget where the money came from first and foremost. Okay. Yes, Jane. Um, thank you. Um, on page nine of 66, um, we have the, um, the, the way at which we get to 609,000 um, pounds. Can I ask, in, in respect to those planters, which are, I, again, that I think is incredibly important, the greening, the greening of the area, exactly what actually Graham's talking about, making the place look more attractive and more countrified and more just altogether um, uh, uh, appealing. Um, does that, is that all included in that? Um, is that something that we're, we're going to be able to have out of that? Or are we simply talking about, um, uh, well, basically, tarmac and stone? Because, um, you see, my understanding, this second home fund was actually principally to be applied to affordable housing. And the report that's been referred to by the officer um, indicated in November that there was 2.9 million left in that particular um, um, fund, um, and um, it was being applied to tax used to support affordable housing. So I have to say I'm not absolutely clear about this, and, and I want to be completely clear about it, because it says in that report that we were given that it was being used for affordable housing. That's why I think probably um, members are just a little bit concerned about it. It's to be absolutely clear what we use. In, indeed, some members. Members. Thank you. Um, the, the first point about this sort of greenery, I, I, I would have presumed the planters and all that type of work would have been included within the project cost here, but I'll let Paul come in on that side of it first. No, we, we're actually picking up the cost of the planters. We're also putting additional funds in to support the project for the next four years and also providing separate community budget. So the, the budget shown here, actually there's still additional funding coming from the trust fund to make sure that the community aspects of the plant are being filled. So that it doesn't include the plant. Okay, and I'll bring John in for your second point, Jim. Thanks, Chair. Um, 
the reference I made before about the father fifteen two million pounds was after the, the after the proposals were in the paper that they agreed to the last year. So that was the people I know that related to the unallocated balances through the ship process, members agreed additional funding to support the existing balance payments for that two million pounds. But I'll I'll certainly make sure that members are given an updated balance and that would be helpful for it if it is around two million pounds. Um, in terms of the application of the scheme, um, it, it, the, the council has got flexibility about using those funds as long as it satisfies itself that they are uh, supporting housing-related projects. And so that's the advice I give you. Okay, then, members. No further questions. Can we go to the recommendation? Uh, 2.1, members are asked to agree to the undertaking of statutory procedures for relevant traffic orders, and if no objections are received, proceed to implementation of the street design project. And 2.2, to allocate an additional 165,000 from the council tax second homes budget to match the fund, uh, to match fund the 305 contribution made by Sustrans. Thank you. Item five on the agenda, Common Housing Register Review, a progress report. Um, can I, John, can I ask if you have any update on this? Um, thanks, Chair. Nothing particularly to add to the report other than just to advise that uh, it's an update progress report just to keep members sighted on the work that we've uh, undertaken through the CHR review. We're happy to an uh, answer any questions. Okay. Members? Graham? Thanks, Chair. Just a clarification. 3.6. At this stage, the anticipated final report and recommendations, final report and recommendations, will be available at the end of July. This will allow sufficient time to consult and incorporate the views of area committees. Now, I was always quite clear with the understanding that this was to go around area committees, and the report states that to be the case. But if it's the final report and recommendations, are you telling me that we'll go around the area committees we don't meet in August, September, back end of the year time? Area committees will express their views and opinions on it, but will they be incorporated or is the final report being put in front of us as a fait accompli? I've got a clarification in that. Also, clarification in the SNG special needs group. I don't see much mention of it at all in here. Now, this, in my personal experience, is a real hot potato in the whole thing. So when it comes in front of area committees, I, I would trust that area committees will have a meaningful contribution. The report will incorporate any views from each of the four area committees. And will the SNG be fully addressed because it's not worth the money? It's, uh, it's, it's my understanding that the, the area committees will have full consultation on this report. Once, once the reviews uh, goes out uh, and all the all the different aspects of the review are collated together and then that report will go around the area committees and they will have the opportunity to scrutinise and then make recommendations towards that uh, before, before um, to, to influence the final report, shall we say. But I'll, I'll ask John for confirmation. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Just, just to confirm, your intention is to consult uh, with all the area committees in advance of finalising the report. So what we're looking at is taking it to the area committees in, in the July cycle. I think the date of the first would be by the 15th of July. We'll take the, um, the findings, survey findings, and the, the, the draft uh, recommendations around area committees to consult, and the comments from area committees will then feed into the final report. So you won't be getting it after July, you'll be getting it part of the process. Um, in, terms, in terms of the looking at the, what, what the CHR review will look at, it's looking at the whole operation, including the common allocations policy, and that will include the operational and effectiveness of the current strategic needs category and how that's being used. So that is included and is part and parcel of the comprehensive review that we're doing this year. Yeah, thanks, Chair. I take some comfort from that. Uh, perhaps you should drop the word final report and recommendations so will be available by the end of July that will allow the area committee. A report will come in front of the area committee it will mean that we'll have meaningful consultation and it will be fed back into the SNG or SNP group will be fully addressed within the report that comes before the area committee. Is that my understanding? Thanks, Chair. Good. Yeah, I have to confirm that that will happen. 
Jim? Uh, just a brief question. I hope we get the bad news along with the good. I've had a couple of complaints recently along with last week about alleged failings in dealing with appropriate applicants. One that was recently sexually and religious sexually abused. I'm sure that that complaint was more than positive, but also that it peaked up here. If something's not happening, members will want to hear of it as well. It's taking things that are happening. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. I think there's two elements to in response to that. First of all, if, if anyone, if any applicant has got a specific issue, either in terms of the way that their application has been dealt with or the way that their rehousing application has been dealt with, an offer of housing has been dealt with, then you need to contact the landlord in the first instance to make sure that that's dealt with. If they're an applicant, then you need to contact the HR administration team, and they would need to deal with that and deal with that application. In terms of lessons learned from how it's operating, that's the point of the plan of research. Um, the uh, research is, is carrying out a survey of every single applicant who has been rehoused previously so far, and it's attempting to contact them to see what the situation is, and also to carry out a sample telephone survey of everybody who's on the current pool of development, so it's to pick up those kind of issues, good, bad, or indifferent to the company. So if anyone's got a particular issue and a current issue, I would urge them to take it up with either the landlord or the, the city of development. Thanks. No further members, can we move to the recommendations? Uh, members are asked to note the progress of the Common Housing Register review and overall reporting timeline as detailed at 3.6 of the report and just to take note of Councillor Foster's comments on that. Thank you for that. Uh, yes, Alistair. Chair, when you say take note, I presume you mean by that it would be incorporated into the decision? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you. Moving on, item six of the agenda, the Dumfries and Galloway Small Communities Housing Trust Business Plan 2015 to 2020. Uh, the report is to provide an opportunity for members to consider and comment upon the Dumfries and Galloway Small Communities Housing Trust Business Plan. Um, John, are you going to take us through this with the, possibly the help of Jamie? Uh, yeah, thanks, Chair. Nothing, nothing further to add to, to the report. As, as you say, Jamie Dent is the Chief Executive Officer of Small Communities Housing Trust here, and uh, with your agreement, I'm happy to take any questions that the Chair may have. Yes, I think that would be, a, be appropriate. Um, members, yes, Jim. Uh, Jamie, do you, have you got a microphone available to you there? You may, the, the, you may like to just take us through a few points of the, the plan first if you if you want to or are you happy just to uh, receive questions Jim thank you yeah thanks chair it, it's not really a question on the business plan uh, about the acronym in 3.1 RHOG REPG what does that stand for because it doesn't explain it anywhere in the report nor does it explain it at the front where it normally does Exactly. An REPG is a now defunct um, Scottish Government funding stream. It stands for Rural Empty Property Grant. Uh, the other one was another defunct um, housing grant, which was the Rural Home Ownership Grant. And this was a grant to help people do self build. Alistair. Thanks very much, Chair. It's uh, page 29. Uh, top of tra page 29 under the, uh, the rubric, uh, the side heading of land identification uh, and uh, references made to the involvement of the uh, trust in uh, the village of Monreith. So we're talking about 10 rental properties and three low cost self build plots. Now, let me reassure you before I go any further, Chair, I'm not trying to rehearse uh, what you know has taken place in the past and hopefully you know, we'll put, uh, you know, we, we can move on from that. But there is a, there is a, a, a technical question, Chair, for want of a better term. Uh, and, you know, the, 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 the issue, I think, which is still exercising uh, members of the Monreith and Action District Group is the possibility that uh, now that the uh, DGHP uh, side of the project is, is nearing completion, uh, that by the time 
uh, these three self-built plots are, are marketed. By the time uh, detailed planning permission is, is got, presumably uh, for the purchasers uh, you know, to take forward their proposals, uh, and by the time that the work uh, in these uh, is, is completed, the village of Monreath, and it's a very attractive village, you know, Chair, it could be living or be forced to live with what some of them, uh, some of the residents are saying it would be not too dissimilar to a, a building site, depending on how circumstances pan out. Now, I don't think that would be in anyone's interests, uh, certainly not the community, certainly not the small housing uh, trust's interests either. And my question to, rather, to Jamie rather than to John would be, uh, can we uh, imp you know, impose conditions, uh, Chair, and the sale, for instance, of the land uh, which would uh, obviate that situation arising. In other words, uh, I think we all know, Chair, that we're, all, we're told often enough anyway that uh, if you get planning consent, you start your work, you know, that secures the planning consent essentially in perpetuity. But uh, if, in fact, the Small Communities Housing Trust were to sell uh, these plots to, uh, to purchasers and put in, perhaps, a, a time stipulation whereby that they would have to complete or produce, be able to produce a completion certificate within a specified period of time from the date of conclusion of missives. That, to me, sir, uh, it, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not a very subtle uh, you know, suggestion, but you know, that, to me, would at least uh, allow us you know, to sort of look at the possibility of, of addressing that, or if there are any better suggestions, uh, either that the Trust uh, have in mind or that they're already implementing, I'd be delighted to hear them. Uh, apart from anything else, uh, I've got a survey in Monreath next week, and it would be good to be able to report back in a positive fashion. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Alistair. Yeah, I mean, from that uh, meeting that we, we attended with the Monreath Action Group, uh, I believe one of the actions that came from that was to have those plots advertised uh, as, as soon as possible. Um, I, I, I'm not aware whether that's happened or not, but I'll, I'll let Jamie come in on that. Um, well, to go from the second question backwards, the plots are now on the market and have been so for quite some time. We've had uh, a few expressions of interest. I'm working through those. Some of those are viable, some of them aren't. But the most recent one appears to be quite viable. The, um, in terms of the time restriction, that's a standard practice. Uh, you know, in terms of what's been done elsewhere in the country where this has happened, um, I think the time frame that Stanley used is two years, but um, you know, we can look at that. Very grateful, Chair. Can, can I, I, can I, I'm not suggesting for one moment that the Trust you know, sort of operate an unreasonable time scale, but can I suggest that we tend to urge truncating rather than towards extending and, uh, as I say, allowing people you know, to sort of, uh, operate forever in a day. Grateful, Chair. Thank you. No other members? Okay. Okay. Recommendations in, please. Members are asked to consider the Dumfries and Galloway Small Communities Housing Trust Business Plan 2015 to 2020 and consider whether its summary or its content should be included in the future local housing strategy. Yes, Alistair. Can I suggest, Chair, that we, 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 there's a lot of good stuff in here. Can I suggest that we note and approve terms of the, uh, the, the business plan? And I would certainly agree that we should include a summary uh, of the contents in a future local housing strategy. Members in agreement with that? Okay, yes, thank you, we'll do that. Okay, moving on to item seven, Dumfries and Gallery Small Communities Housing Trust funding request. Um, John, have you anything else to add to this? Um, nothing further to add to, to the report, uh, just to remind members that um, the original funding for this project was agreed back in May 2012. We're running since May 13. The trust has secured an additional one year extension to support the construction, but I think uh, we're masking that with the uh, one off annual uh, allocation to the county, effectively to allow the project to be completed, um, by which point, hopefully, um, they'll be in a position to take advantage of the housing initiative. Members, Jane. Um, I, I'd like to say that I have absolutely no difficulty with this proposal. I think this is exactly right, and uh, given the modest amount of money um, with which uh, 
we might be able to lever in considerably more funding um, for rural housing, small rural housing, small issues to deal with, um, small problems, but nevertheless have a big effect in rural areas. Um, I would suggest that we agree it. Okay. Thank you. Okay, item eight, strategic housing investment plan. Um, members have requested to agree changes to the, the ship. Uh, that, was, that was agreed by the housing subcommittee on the 20th of November and allocate council funding to support its delivery. John, have you anything to add to the report? Thanks, Chair. Um, no, um, nothing particularly to add except to point out that it, it, it relates to two specific projects, detail two, two, three. We're looking to include an additional project by referring to the ship and to allocate uh, funding to support the first project which is the completion of the new housing plan. We're happy to take any questions. Jim? Thanks, Jim. Thornhill, when, when we take applications on five at the moment, we have a fee for operation of the project. And I think this, particularly when we're looking to achieve that level of money. I think the only thing in the Thornhill one is that I'm kind of confused because you're making reductions in 12 to 11, and then you say the additional unit can be funded. It, it, it seems to be like normally it, it's a different unit less than an additional one. It's certainly a different one. But uh, I, think it's, I think it's a very, very good use in uh, funds. It's probably just a bit of necessary provision there, and, and I'm happy to support that. I think it's probably just referring to the fact that um, you know the, the additional two, two. Yeah, I, I understand that. Yeah, maybe it's the report could have been uh, worded a bit better. One point that I had on that particular one as well, and, and it's been clarified. I was a bit concerned that um, losing a unit in that taking that particular site from twelve down to eleven units, uh, then we were losing our allocation on the ship from Scottish government. On the, on the unit basis, and therefore our uh, percentage of funding based on units. Um, but that's been confirmed that that doesn't happen. That particular unit that we were we are losing on by taking two into one there is transferred through the ship into another project. So we'll still have that, maintain that amount of funding from Scottish government on the ship as a whole. Um, Jim, next one. Yeah, thanks, Chair. I have absolutely no problems with the alterations in Thornhill 1, nor the inclusion of the Merrick Road 1 in Castle Douglas. I think they're both good schemes. However, I just have one little question. The inclusion of a new scheme, what does that do to any, any timeline of new schemes that are already in the ship? Will it alter them in any way? I know they are only an indication of when they're likely to start. John? Thanks, Chair. No, it wouldn't have any impact on the delivery of other schemes, particularly given that the Merrick Road proposal is just a one unit detail. So there's, there's no there's no implication. Jane? Why do Scottish Government officers um, produce more money through the AHIT for Merrick Road, um, but not for Abbeyfield project? Um, First question and second question, just as a fact, a fact: How many units are there in Merrick Road now? Is it two? Or is it more? Thanks, Chair. In terms of the first question, it's to do with the complexities of the Scottish government funding scheme. Um, existing properties look look to be adapted by RSL. Um, routinely, would go through what's called stage two funding. And there's a very prescriptive process about what can be included in kind of permissible costs. Um, and given the extent of the work required for Merrick Road, because of the particular need that the fire department has been identified, um, they're saying that that would exceed the stage two funding formula. And it would cause some complications to try and get all the exemptions needed to, to deliver that within a reasonable time scale. 
and it's been put it through the chairperson of Ferguson, those rules are binding to the state and they say to the state. So it's a kind of technical thing, you know, that we need to address through the state. And it's because of the way that the Scottish governments have different policies for different types of projects. Um, in relation to the size of the fee, it's, it's a single unit and we're looking to convert it into a use for uh, two, two clients, basically a council each and pension. But it's not, it's not reducing the number of units, it's a conversion of the fee. And I think that one in particular uh, will be a very worthwhile project because we'll be able to bring those clients back into Dumfries and Galloway and instead of having them housed out with the region. Any other members? No? Okay, we can move to the recommendations, please. Uh, 2.1, members are asked to agree to the changes required to the Council's strategic housing investment plan as detailed at 3.2 and 3.3 of this report. And 2.2, .2, to allocate £59,582 from the Council tax income on second homes to support the delivery of the unit at Thornhill to meet the specific needs of the household that are being referred through the homes for D&G as the strategic needs group six. Thank you. Item number nine, licensing of houses in multiple occupation and registration of private landlords. And I believe Alan Glendinning is going to take us through this report. Thanks, Chair. Uh, the report's fairly self-explanatory, I would hope. Uh, in terms of the, the specific aspects and the determinations through the licensing panel, um, there have been quite a number of determinations through the licensing panel and the results are, are shown um, with the, uh, the, the named individuals uh, obviously excluded from the, the terms of the report. Uh, I would probably say that that doesn't reflect in any way the amount of work that's actually put into seeking uh, compliance um, before taking uh, enforcement action as a last resort. Um, in, in terms of the fee structure, um, the fees were last reviewed in 2009, six years ago. Uh, there are proposals and options provided uh, with uh, a recommendation that, uh, that a sliding sc uh, scale is, is introduced. Uh, in reaching the, the figures that we've come up with, um, we have gone from uh, an end-to-end -end process of accepting uh, an application right through to the, the completion stage of, of granting the license. Uh, and these, uh, as far as possible, reflect uh, the accurate, a uh, fairly accurate assessment of the costs involved in, in, in determining and, and processing a, a license fee. Um, the property footprint print fee that's, uh, that's noted, um, there are uh, very, very few um, applications in, in the Fries and Galloway where this applies. Um, we have looked at uh, and again made an assessment of the time involved. Um, there was a, an 80% reduction for each uh, identical property uh, previously there. Um, we, we suggest a, a reduction from 80% to 75% uh, of the full fee, uh, which again reflects the, the the assessed actual time involved in, in processing such an application. Um, in terms of the, the situation across the whole of Scotland, it puts us in a fairly mid position in terms of uh, the fee structure. Um, we're not near the top, we're not near the bottom, we're sort of mid-range. Uh, and I think in terms of overall cost, uh, if the sliding scale option is uh, adopted, um, then I, I've given an indication that in, in terms of cost per landlord, it, it's a, a cost of less than one pound per month per occupant in terms of renewals. Um, that really uh, is a summary of, of what we've got, and if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you, Alan. Members? Jim? Hey, Alan's really asked my first question. It was under 3.4.4 about how much out of pocket we are at the minute, but hey, Alan reasonably answered that one. Hey, I'll hey, listen to any other members' hey, views, but to be perfectly honest, I think option two is actually the best one. The more you have, the more you pay. Uh, and just on the original thing that uh, Alan was saying about the uh, outcomes of decision, the one on, it's on page 61, the one on, uh, on the 1st of April last year, it says the renewal of HMO license by objections from neighbours, decision granted to 39.14 when further renewal will be required. What was the outcome of that one? Did he get it? Did he not? Alan? Yes, certainly the, that, that was one specific uh, problem tenant in a property. Um, that was resolved and the, the subsequent application was granted. Alistair? 
I don't wish to truncate discussion under any circumstances, Chair, but I have no problem with what to say with any of the recommendations. And I note that it's um, from the table on page 61. Uh, uh, it's obvious that the licensing panel are doing a robust job in that situation, so I congratulate them for that. Any further members? Jeff? Just in terms of the addition of conditions, so seriously. You know, I would expect a, land, a decent landlord to maintain proper street proper condition anyway. <coughs> No further members. Um, go to the recommendations. 2.1, note the outcomes of the fit and proper person determination by the licensing panel in relation to private landlord registration and the licensing of houses in multiple occupation. 2.2, agree to introduce the sliding scale fee structure, which is option two for HMO license application described at section 3.6 of this report with immediate effect. Chair, before you do that, there isn't a 3.6, it's a 3.4.6, but just for, for, for the sake of governance. Okay, noted. Governance, start that, please. Thank you, Jim. Uh, 2.3, agrees to introduce the four new license conditions. In Appendix 2 in relation to the granting of future HMO licenses and renewals. And 2.4, agree to reduce the footprint fee discount from 80% to 75% of the primary fee applicable as described in Section 3.4.9 of this report. Thank you. I have no further business, so thank you very much, members, for attending this committee.